coming up on Chopper's Politics. We've had a lot of drama in the Labour Party over the <laughs> last five years. I think I would take a bit of bland over what we had was very funny, very exciting, but, but awful incompetence. Hello, I'm Christopher Hope, the Telegraph's Chief Political Correspondent, and welcome to Chopper's Politics, your weekly update on all things political. I'm armed with a coffee and microphone at my desk for yet another remote edition of this podcast. The atmosphere isn't quite on a par with the Red Lion pub, although don't tell my family I said that. Now, before we start, you may have noticed that there have been a couple of extra episodes this week. And if you haven't listened already, please do tune in to our interview with the former Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn. Now, Sam left us a review on Apple Podcasts saying, another fantastic scoop for Chopper. Magnificent stuff as always. P.S. More Mrs. Chopper, please. Well, she's here, Sam. Oh, hello. Well, Sam quite likes you, Mrs. Chopper. Will you come back again and and record bits more from our living room? I would love to come any time, Mr. Chopper. And please give my love to Sam. Thank you, Mrs. Chopper. You can go now. Oh. (laughs) So today we have a smorgasbord of guests to help us get through these difficult, self-isolating days. Think Tank boss and ex-Telegraph political editor James Kirkup will be here talking about which politicians have come out to the fore during the pandemic. And former Labour advisor Aisha Hazarika will be joining us to talk about whether the opposition's new leader, Sir Keir Starmer, has finally restored hope to the party of getting back into office. But first, as we record, the Prime Minister remains in intensive care in St Thomas's Hospital in London, being treated for the symptoms of coronavirus. Now, there have been questions about how decisions will be made during his illness, with Dominic Raab, the first Secretary of State, stepping in. But someone who knows the burden of being a Deputy PM is Sir David Liddington, who, under Theresa May, was the former Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster and was called the de facto Deputy PM. David Liddington, welcome to Chopper's Politics. And normally we're in the Red Lion pub, so normally I would have bought you a drink right <laughs> Normally clinks in the background. I can, I can yeah. get some glasses and a bottle out if you want, want to give <laughs> some authenticity. <laughs> How are you? I'm keeping well, thank you. You know, I mean, as with everybody, it's sort of fingers crossed. And, and, and that, that, that sort of traditional greeting of... How, how are you? It really does take on a new resonance during the current. I know it's pandemic. meant with feeling, and uh, and often you don't know how the what the answer might be either. No. Now we're watching politics from our sitting rooms, aren't we? At the moment, we're all at, at home trying to work out what's going on. You've been you've been a, a long-standing minister working for Theresa May. Don't you think the government should be more honest about extending this lockdown after Monday? Well, I, I think two points on that, that because I mean first. It's pretty clear to me, um, listening to what the senior scientific and medical advisors have been saying on the record at uh, press conferences, that it is vanishingly unlikely that anything will happen other than an extension of the lockdown. My hunch is for a further three weeks or, or so, because no one yet knows whether we are at the peak or if not yet how far from the peak we are, let alone how rapidly after that point the number of new cases and then eventually the number of deaths is going to to drop. Is it going to be a a sharp drop down, as we all hope, or is it going to be much more gradual that means restrictions have to be in place for longer? So I I can understand that the government set itself a three-week time frame. They will want to have gone through the exercise of looking at the evidence as it comes in, I've been, I've no doubt at all about the uh, the outcome of that, particularly given what the Welsh government has 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 now said publicly. They're they're not going to and the London mayor as well yesterday. Yeah, no, that's right, the London mayor. Too. But I mean, the the other point I would make is I th- I think it's a more a more general point about uh, the handling of COVID nineteen and, and public communications that I think there's there's merit in ministers being just open with the public about the inherent complexity and uncertainty of many of the decisions that they are taking. Again, if you listen to the scientists, even the top epidemiologists, both here and around the world, are very open in saying that this is a completely new disease. 
they are literally learning day by day how this virus behaves, how infectious it is, which groups within the human population are at particularly high or particularly low risk of contracting it, and if contracting it, you know, in a in a serious or or a mild version. So you know, things like the infectiousness, the the mortality rates, you know, whether and for how long people will have immunity after they've been through it. You know, p- people are learning this, and I think pu- the public understands that, and I think the public is grown up and is prepared in this current crisis to hear from ministers about some of the problems that they are they are wrestling with. So why aren't they being honest about it then? Why not say, look, here, am I, here are the workings I'm seeing. You can see how hard it is to call the end to this. We are looking at these numbers. We're doing our best. Other countries appear to be more, more willing to, to work through that in public. And I wonder why we're not. I, I think there's probably a just a built-in nervousness in our system of government. This is not a, a, you know, in any way a poker in individuals. So I think how I used to to have to think and act and speak when I was sort of in in, in their position. The, the there's an expectation that the public expects you to have certainty, and I, and I actually think that in the current crisis, the public does expect ministers to have a grip. They expect ministers to be clear about what it is that they are doing now and what the considerations are that will shape their future decisions. But I think the public will accept that people I talk to, you know, in 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 the 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 distanced queues outside the supermarket or the chemist shop, completely accept that there's a a lot we don't still don't know about this disease. So if, if you were there now as de facto deputy PM, you'd be saying to them, look, let's let's be more upfront. Let's let's not try and and hide what's happening here because people will get they'll get frustrated. Yeah, I think it's true. I think the other thing that is is coming, and I do have a lot of sympathy with this, is that people like me and you follow public affairs closely. You know, we we read newspapers, we 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 look at online sources, we watch TV news bulletins and current affairs programs. Most of the population doesn't do that. I always remember Jim Messon, I know Obama's uh, campaign boss, saying to uh, a media conservative MPs is some years back now, he said, how, how often does the average voter think about politics? It was something like, you know, four or five minutes a week, um, <laughs> the average <laughs> voter spends thinking about politics. And there'll be a lot of people out there who um, the government needs to reach with the messages about physical distancing, only necessary travel outside the home you know don't go on holiday don't go and visit your extended family or your friends and these if these are people who don't read any newspaper um who just don't normally watch uh, uh, news programs find it boring produce, are, you find them boring are switched off from from what government and any public information broadcast is saying um well you know you've got to keep the message simple and keep on repeating it. And I actually think that's one reason I think why it's cert- we, I'm certainly in my mind, we're not going to see any uh, sort of relaxation in the short term, because with this Easter weekend coming up and warm weather beyond that, you know, people will want to be reinforcing the message about keeping your distance, staying at home, because diluting that risks some people sort of, sort of taking advantage and say, OK, well, that's fine, we can go back to normal life straight away. So but I can see the need for simplicity uh, in message sort of cuts against what I was saying about about acknowledging complexity. Don't you think that every single decision being made now is so big that the government wants Boris Johnson to at least be awake and able to participate in it? And that may be why they're delaying uh, deciding on the, finally on, a, on an extension. I can understand that. It's because the this is a man, let's not forget, who won a very decisive general election mandate four months ago. Which, and, and one that was seen, I mean, just I think, as, as very much a personal win for him uh, uh, at that election. And therefore, he has that authority that comes from the electoral mandate. And I, and I think it's, it, it's um, you know, everybody knows, you know, he will, you know, God willing, you know, be, be returning to, to, to work after, you know, days or week we don't we don't know exactly how long it's going to take you know i think we all hope as rapidly as possible and that you know, he is still the head of the government that you want to take a decision if you're there in the interim that he you think he will be able to accept and 
live with uh, uh, rather than have to revisit and sort of unpick or amend later on. So they will want to, they will want to get it right. I think I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not. In, you know, I don't want to impugn the motives of, of, of people around the cabinet cabinet table. They're in a really difficult position at the moment. But I think what they need to do, and I think they will do, is to recognise that you know, Boris is still the head of government. That you know they will try to do something they think he will be content with. But they will also, above all, I think, be trying to do the right thing from the point of view of the public interest. Now, listen, uh, you, of course, you were de facto Deputy PM under Theresa May. What was your actual title? I'm sure you know it. I was I was Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster and uh, Minister of the Cabinet Office. But you were called the de facto deputy. Now, why was that? I know I called you a few times. Was it made known that you were the, the deputy? And yeah, you... when Theresa appointed me, she she made it clear that she wanted me to to be you know, number two in the in the cabinet. On the I was sort of listed as you know second in command after her on the in in the published ranking order of the cabinet. And and you know in her absence, it would be me who would chair meetings of this, that, or the other. But you weren't called um, first secretary of state. Why why was that? Do you know? I mean, I, I, you know, never, never explained to me precisely why. I mean, my view, having done that job, is that although I'm, I'm not somebody who really worries a great deal about those titles, actually, it does help because if somebody has the title of first secretary, or, or even, even more so, I think deputy prime minister, then it, it, it means that the Whitehall machine. Yeah, responds you know, every better private to office, it. Every perm sec, no, you need to, they know instantly. Okay, that's the chain of command. If for whatever reason the PM can't do something, this is who we turn to. But also that if if this person is appointed to chair a committee, that they are acting pretty much with delegated authority from the prime minister to do that. I just think that the benefit of say Dominic having the title now is is that it it just makes it very clear. It signposts. Uh, the political substance at an earlier stage. Boris Johnson being incarcerated in hospital, having the disease, do you think any sense that his um, his absence has left the power vacuum in Whitehall? I mean, I know you said there isn't one technically, but there is one in the sense they're waiting, as you say there, for him maybe to be awake next week or, or be able to respond and to uh, to accept this this extending this decision. No, I, I, I genuinely don't think that there is a power vacuum. I mean, clearly... Boris Johnson brings a particular sort of exuberant style of leadership, which it is which just isn't that isn't isn't there at the moment. It can't be there where well, he's not personally there. But most government work goes on without the need for the prime minister to uh, intervene and bro- uh, you know, arbitrate between differences uh, and broker deals. Most government decisions are resolved between different departmental ministers, either at informal meetings or at more formal cabinet committee meetings. So that work is all going on as usual. And I and 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 I mean Dominic Rab, because he's not the prime minister, he's the deputy to the prime minister, is you know, chairing meetings and he will have a responsibility where there are differences to try to uh, work out a, a compromise and uh, a way forward. And Dominic will face some challenges in, in that because you know, he's not the PM, but also remote working makes it more difficult. When I used to chair meetings and I was trying to gauge, you know, the way through the, some quite um, big differences sometimes between different members of Theresa May's cabinet, I, you know, I'd be trying to read the body language in the room. You know, I'd notice one minister speaking and then somebody on the other side of the table was grimacing uh, or rolling his eyes at the ceiling. And I'd sort of, ha- I'd sort of go to that minister, hang on, are you disagreeing with this then? Then you could work out where you were what the solution might be. Sometimes I grab somebody before a meeting started or at the end and try to just to cajole them into doing something that I wanted to get a, a deal. You can't do that if you're on Zoom. So it is more difficult just technically because of the way we're all having to work now. But having having made those caveats, Dominic will be taking, you know, if you like, the more consensual, you know, primus inter pares, first amongst equals style in the chair than, than Boris might 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 do with his particular style. But also, I think both on Dominic and every other member of the cabinet, there will be a very sharp awareness that the public is looking at them and expecting them to demonstrate leadership and solidarity and mutual loyalty and not 
allow themselves to squabble in public and be come across as divided or lacking grip. So they, they'll be very conscious of public expectations and public duty. Well, David Linton, thank you so much for joining us on this sunny morning uh, on Chopper's Politics. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right, stay with me. Coming up, we'll be talking to think tank boss and former political editor of The Telegraph, James Kirkup, right after this. Go beyond the headlines with The Telegraph's daily coronavirus podcast, a roundup of the latest news on the pandemic from our leading journalists, with analysis on the impact on health, business and travel every weekday evening. Search Coronavirus The Latest on your podcast app. Right, welcome back to my front room. Now, with the press conferences becoming a fixture in many people's days, certain cabinet members seem to be getting a lot more attention in the public eye. Rishi Sunak, Matt Hancock and Dominic Raab are what you might call professional politicians in the mould of George Osborne or David Cameron, a type of politician that we thought we had grown weary of. Well, here to discuss how this group is now taking a step forward in this crisis is director of the Social Market Foundation and former Daily Telegraph political editor, James Kirkup. James, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Chris. Nice to be here. I think you probably gave, gave, my, gave my nickname Chopper back in the day because I used to work with you at the Scotsman all those years ago where it first was, was carved from the uh, English language. Terrifyingly long time ago, it was all to, it was all to do with logins on the logins to the old system, wasn't it? it was, yeah, see C- hop, yeah, yeah, C- C- yeah, hop. That's right. But you, but you now, of course, you're the director of the Social Market Foundation. Also, you're writing very good blogs and interesting blogs for the Spectator and for Telegraph occasionally. And you wrote this week, didn't you, that the success of Matt Hancock and Richie Sunak in explaining what's going on and keeping people giving an idea of grip on government shows why we need professional politicians. Now, those two words, professional politicians, were banned words. That was, that was seen as a bad thing, wasn't it, just a few a few years ago, and now it's not, not so much. Well, yeah. I suppose the, the interesting thing for me in all this is if you look at the... We're having a sort of daily talent show you know, in the, the daily briefings about politicians and their ability to project grip and a sort of confident management of of the system and and to an extent you can get carried to get carried away with how how good you whether or not someone gives good press conference or not but actually it there is a real substance to doing well in those briefings because lots of people are watching them and the key to government policy at the moment is getting people to buy into what the government is doing the only way we all stay at home and you know, buy into lockdown is if we think that there is a purpose to it that the Guys making the decisions know what they're doing. And so it's important that when we turn on the TV or look at the phone or, and follow those briefings, that we think the people making the decisions know what they're doing and have some sense of command and control over everything. I am very struck by the fact that it is Rishi Sunak and Matt Hancock, who I think have come across as the most convincing, the people who, who have the facts and figures at the fingertips, and essentially project that sense that they are they are running the machine. They are operating the machinery of government effectively to achieve their chosen ends. And if you look at their CVs, they are politicians who we were told had become extinct or had been forbidden. I mean, these are people both, I mean, they're both disgustingly young, by which I mean younger than me. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, they, 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 I mean, they, they are from the Cameron Osborne, Miliband, Blair era. Yeah, the days when you know, you know, politicians went to Oxbridge, Oxford often, uh, uh, did PPE, knocked around doing, you, you might yeah, you might have done something in private life for a little while in your 20s, maybe to make some money as of interest, but then you get sucked into the vortex of Westminster, and before you know it, you're, M- you're an MP in your 30s and you're a cabinet minister before you're 40, and you've never, you know, and, and the, the critique was made, these people have never done a real job in their lives. They're solely creatures of politics, and that's what gave us... Yeah, Ed Miliband is what gave us David Cameron, George Osborne. And so the theory went that the, the referendum was finally the final explosion of the professional PP-educated, jumped-up, spad class. We were no longer going to be run by these people. 
Um, that what we wanted was real characters, authentic politicians, people with a sense of real, real, real life and connection to the outside world. And that we now we now judge politicians not by their ability to come up with six point policy plans or uh, yeah thirty point task for, yeah task force initiatives, um, but we yeah we we wanted our leaders to be people who could connect to us and our emotions and read the mood of the nation and understand the real world. Well, actually, yeah, now I think when the fate of the nation turns on the government machinery functioning properly, what you want is primarily some people who understand how that machine works, who can take a, if you like, a technocratic approach, not interested in politics, not bluntly interested in winning arguments, or not even so much hearts and minds necessarily, who just know how to get things done. And I think Matt Hancock, uh, Rishi Sunak, lifelong politicos, both elected in the 30s, both in the cabinet before. before. And of course, uh, uh, Hancock, Hancock was helped. He, he was helped last week, wasn't he, by, by coming in after the, the, in the wake of two lacklustre performances, Malok Sharma and Robert Jenrick, I think, last week, wasn't it? So he, he, And he came out, he bounced back from his disease, didn't he? And he came out punching with 100,000 tests by the end of the month. And, a, and he's, he's drawn a line. Your familiar term, James, when I was working with you, was the line in the, in the sand journalism. Well, he's done that, hasn't he, by saying 100,000 <laughs> tests by the end of April. And of course, if we came back in a month's time and he missed that, you may be saying something different. Yeah, no, definitely, yes. I mean, they, they, we're not they, they, the jury is still out on this, but but I think it was it was very important. I mean, you got you know, you, you obviously we should all we should all be wary of overplaying the importance of of headlines. But yeah, like I say, at the moment, this stuff matters. You know, if you remember back in the middle of last week, um, there was a feeling across your yeah your brethren sistren in the lobby translating through through the health correspondence into the headlines and therefore percolating out into public opinion that the government was a bit rudderless, didn't have any grip, didn't know what it was doing, didn't have any answers on the testing questions, that lots of people were scratching their heads and thinking, well, hang on a minute, do these guys know what they're doing? And that's really, I mean, to, I, mean I don't overuse the word, that, that, that was a dangerous moment because when you are asking the entire country to stay at home, and to dis- disrupt their normal economic lives, that will only happen if people have confidence in the government's plan. And so last week, when we got to the point where a lot of people were saying, you know what, do these guys know what they're doing? Do they have a plan? It was very important that somebody came out and steadied the ship and looked and sounded like they did, in fact, have a plan. And so I think it was very you know, that Matt Hancock performance, it may well, it didn't, it did give hostages to fortune. And yeah, he made, he made promises and by golly, he'd best deliver. But the fact that he, you know, that there was someone there who was able to come out and say, you know what, I've, you know, I, I am the man with a plan. That stuff matters. It's too early to say, James. But just finally, do you think what will be the political fallout from this crisis? <laughs> because I look, I look at the Chilcot inquiry that took about five years to to conclude. I mean, the inquiry into this and all the choices made, the paper trails that are being laid as we speak, will have a massive bearing, don't you think, on the next election? I mean, inevitably. I mean, if, if that's dare I say, if 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 we have to wait that long for an election, I mean, yes, it will it will be enormous. Um, how how it will work out, I have absolutely no idea. I think that the the spread of options from here runs from Boris Johnson being prime minister for the rest of this decade and going down in history as being one of the you know, beloved national leaders to uh, Keir Starmer being prime minister by the end of this year. I, you know, it is genuine you, uh, and I think anybody who puts their hand, yeah, their hand up and says, "Look, I know what's going to happen. This is this is the outcome," is bluffing. And so I'm not going to, I shall not bluff. On that note, do come back, James Kirkup, the director of the Social Market Foundation. Thank you for coming on Trump's Politics. Thank you. Pleasure. Now, amongst all the news of the coronavirus, we also gained a new Labour leader this week. Sir Keir Starmer has taken the reins of the Labour Party, replacing Jeremy Corbyn. And he heard James Kirkup saying there that he thinks he could be Prime Minister by the end of the year. Maybe. So has Sir Keir restored hope to Labour? I'm joined now by former Labour advisor Aisha Hazarika. Aisha Hazarika, welcome to Chopper's Politics. Thank you so much for coming on. Where are you? I'm sitting in the heart of the London metropolitan elite um, republic known as Camden Town. (laughs) (laughs) Beneath all this appalling drama, there has been some good news for the Labour Party this week, hasn't there, in the past seven days? Yes. um, The election of Keir 
Starmer has really been a great thing in my view for the for the Labour Party. I mean, we expected him to win. I was so pleased that he won with such an emphatic win. So for me, the the sort of joy was that it wasn't you know, it's like the members across the party are beginning to understand that electing people who will appeal to the public, who are a bit more moderate in not just their views, but how they conduct themselves, they're finally cottoning, cottoning on to the fact that that is actually quite a, that's what the Labour Party needs. Yeah, and that's how you get into power and that's how you deliver on the mandate for people who vote Labour. That's the point of being in politics, isn't it? Not to shout from the sidelines, but to be in power at some point. Yeah, I think what's happened with the Labour Party over the last... Um, well, look, the Labour Party's not been doing well for a long time. We haven't won an election since 2005. We've lost four elections uh, in nine years. But I think there became a prevailing view in the party under Jeremy Corbyn that actually winning power was not that important. It was more important to be in sort of virtuous opposition. But I think, you know, not just the frontline politicians, but the members are suddenly starting to realise that actually that's not the point of the of the Labour Party. We were set up to win power to enact our policies, which can still be radical and progressive. And I think Keir Starmer is going to be, you know, a progressive left wing Labour leader. There's a real chance here, isn't there? I mean, Keir Starmer can appeal to the South. He's a presentable figure that the Southern voters might support, even some Telegraph uh, readers will support. Oh, steady on. <laughs> here, well, let's, let's talk about that. Angela Rayner, his deputy, is someone who can appeal to the North. The, the party looks, it's the beginning of a turnaround, isn't it, I think? It's very early days, but it does feel that way. I mean, um, you know, it, it's been less than a week since Keir Starmer was elected, but it already feels like a very different political party. It feels like a political party with some energy um, and with some credibility, which I think is so, so important because it's not just Labour members who have been crying out for a credible Labour party. It's it's the public. You know, our democracy does not function without a very strong um, opposition, which holds the, you know, feet of the government to the to the fire, particularly now we're in the in the midst of this huge crisis. But I think two things um, have happened since Keir Starmer won actually three things. The first thing is he just looked really comfortable. His interview with Andrew Marr was like a breath of fresh air because as as a you know keen Labour supporter, for the last five years, anybody watching the leader of the Labour Party on any broadcast um, programme would sort of, you know, we'd kind of had like our sort of hands over our eyes just thinking, you know, what's going to happen next? What's, you know, what gaffe is going to happen next? He has an air of, of competency and confidence and sort of quiet uh, assurance, which I think, you know, not just Labour members felt, but the wider public felt. Second thing he's done is he's refashioned the shadow cabinet. He's put together a very, very interesting shadow cabinet. He's got rid of a lot of the old um, real diehard Corbynites. Some of them are standing down anyway, like Diane Abbott and, and John McDonnell, but he got ro- rid of people like Ian Lavery and John Trickett and Richard Bergen. And wh- who he has put in, he's not gone for necessarily uber Blairite people. He's gone for people very much, I think, in his mould of politics. They're soft left, they're hardworking, they're not particularly flashy or flamboyant or showy. But they're worker bees and above all, they're decent. They're not aggressive. They're not vengeful people. And I think given the the history of, of the Labour Party over the last five years, that's very important. And I think he's brought together a good mix of experience, but also fresh faces. And some of the candidates or the, the figures that I think it's worth your listeners looking out for, a couple of names that I would um, say, Annalise Dodds, who's the first ever shadow female chancellor. There's never been a female chancellor in Westminster politics, either as chancellor or as shadow chancellor. She's a real, real rising star. And I think she gains, she has a lot of cred- credibility, but she's also somebody who's seen, she's a great feminist as well. So I think people feel that she will be competent, but also very much thinking about, you know, the inequality agenda at the heart of the economic plan. And another person who I think is a real, really interesting person, and I think he's got a big future ahead of him, is Nick um, Thomas Simmons, who is the new Shadow Home Secretary. He will go up against Priti Patel. He's a Welshman, 
uh, super bright. He was a don at the age of 21. He's written many historical books about politics as well. He's very, very calm. He's very, very measured, but he's got a really sharp brain. And I think he's going to be very interesting to watch, uh, particularly uh, sort of, you know, shadowing Pretty Patel. Wow. Uh, yes, in in interesting there. You said he's competent, Keir Starmer, but is he boring? You know, on the is boring he too question. Dull? I mean, how can he? Well, you know, you know what I mean, don't I, you? I, I mean, I is do, he a bit? I do know that. I've had I've had that crit criticism from people from both the left and and the right. But you know, I feel like we've had a lot of drama in the Labour Party over the <laughs> last five years. And it hasn't exactly served us well. You know, we gifted the Conservatives the, the, the biggest victory they've had in, in generations. I think I would take a bit of bland over what we had was very funny, very exciting, but, but awful incompetence over the last five years. And as I said to somebody, a friend of mine, um, Jeff Norcott, who, um, you know, we've, we've, we've been on here before together. He's a more sort of right-leaning comedian. He was like, oh, come on, but grown-ups are boring, Aisha, grown up. And I said, well, listen, politics is a serious business and we've sort of had socialist soft play for the last five years. So actually, I'd be happy to take a grown-up. And I think the public right now, are quite keen for a grown up because we're in such we're in such serious sombre times we do need a kind of serious sober man do you think it's wise to try and meet with Boris Johnson, Aisha? He hasn't done it yet. He offered to do so, didn't he? Uh, straight away last Saturday, Boris Johnson said, let's meet and discuss a national approach towards the crisis. Um, it hasn't happened yet because the, the PM is now in hospital in an ICU. Was that a wise thing to do? Because it risks uh, tarring him with the same brush if it goes wrong. I think it was the, the right thing to do. And... Um, I think he didn't really have any option. I think it would look very churlish for the leader of the opposition in a time of just national crisis to say, no, no, I'm not going to come to meet you. I think what Keir Starmer has to do is show the public that he will put country above party. You know, when people are burying or not even being able to bury their loved ones, you know, it's this is not the time for sort of profiteering and petty political point scoring. But what he must, must, must not do is allow himself to be boxed in to just carry the blame for this. And I thought his approach on Sunday was pretty smart. So, um, you know, he sort of set out his stall saying, look, I do think the government have got X, Y and Z wrong on testing, on PPE, etc. But I am prepared to, to meet with him. And I think what he will have to do is publicly sort of give the public a kind of running commentary on the things he thinks are, are going wrong and the, the things that he will press the government on. But half the battle in politics is looking and sounding like you're the part. And I think Keir Starmer has got that in him. Aisha Hazarika, thank you so much for, for, for coming on. You're a columnist on The Standard. You're a brilliant stand-up comedian and a commentator. Do, do come on again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, that's all for today. Huge thanks to my guests, Sir David Liddington, James Kirkup, and of course, Aisha Hazarika. Thanks to my producers, Elliot Lampitt, Louisa Wells, and Theo Luludis. But most importantly of all, and I mean this, thank you to you for listening, wherever you are. And if you liked today's episode, please do us a huge favour and leave us a five-star review and a rating on Apple Podcasts, or mention it during your Zoom yoga class, or more likely, your virtual pub quiz contest. Don't forget, you can stay up to date with all the Telegraph's brilliant news and analysis on the pandemic with our daily podcast, Coronavirus, The Latest, featuring an analysis from experts alongside our Telegraph specialists. And if there's anything at all you want us to talk about on this podcast, do email us, chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk, or follow us on Twitter, at Chopper's Podcast. And always, always, always buy a copy of the Daily Telegraph. Until next time, cheerio! Cheerio!